그럼 지금부터 두 번째 기조 세션을 시작하도록 하겠습니다. 이번 세션은 한국대학 교육협의회 주관 세션으로 학생 이동과 교육 고등교육의 국제화라는 주제로 진행되겠습니다. 자장으로는 부국 한국대학교 교육협의회 회장님께서 수고해 주시겠습니다. 부국 회장님 진행 부탁드립니다. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the session, Student Mobility and the Internationalization for Higher Education. My name is Gu Bu, Chairman of Korea Council for University Education and the President of Yongsan University, located in Busan, Korea. It is my great pleasure to chair this session today. The aim of this session is to listen to the current views on higher education in the context of student mobility and internationalization. They are one of the old and traditional topics in higher education. However, the development of information technology changes the methods of knowledge sharing and reproduction. And this makes us reconsider the necessity of student mobility for internationalization. In particular, as the Global HR Forum this year suggests, I would like to examine how student mobility and internationalization could contribute to the topic of diverse talents and changing the world. Uh, we have three speakers today. Our speakers are presidents of world leading higher education institutions. Dr. John Sexton, president of New York University. Uh, Dr. Michael Arthur, president and Provost, University College London, Dr. Stephen Levine, President of California Institute of the Arts. Uh, we will first listen to three consecutive 20-minute speeches. Then we will have rest of the time for discussions, questions, and answers. First, we will have Dr. John Sexton, President of uh, NYU speaking for us. Dr. Sexton, with his knowledgeable law background, has served as the Dean of Law School of uh, New York University before uh, uh, taking his leadership in uh, 2001. Please welcome Dr. Sexton. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's especially a pleasure to be here on a panel with uh, two very old friends. Uh, the connections are deep. Uh, it, it, it turns out that even President Boo and I graduated from law school the same year, uh, 1979. We became presidents the same year, 2001. Although for a brief moment, uh, he was claiming that we're the same age. I'm considerably older than he is. Uh, it took me a lot more time to get it done. Uh, Michael is uh, one of the people I respect in the world of global higher education. He's an extraordinary role model for all of us. And, and his university actually is the template upon which uh, New York University was founded, uh, they in 1826 and we in 1831. So we're twinned in our responsibilities and Stephen's an old, uh, an old connection to NYU. He was actually on the faculty fleetingly, but uh, w has always been a major figure in a world, the world of arts, about which NYU cares. So it's a great honor for me, for me to be here. I I'm going to set some general ideas for us, and, and then uh, my colleagues on the panel will, will elaborate. Michael will do it even with a, a presentation, a slide pack that uh, I'm sure he'll make available to all of us. I want to begin uh, this, this topic, uh, st student 
mobility and the internationalization of higher education is a subset for me of a broader topic, which is uh, perhaps just take, take, take the nouns out, mobility and internationalization. Uh, and uh, those two words can be seen, and therefore student mobility and the internationalization of higher education can be seen in, in the context of a very broad sweep that I think is, uh, is quite important for us to, to notice and, and, and address appropriately. So let me start by, by describing a general phenomena that in, is in the background. To call it, if you want, uh, globalization. Uh, I prefer to call it uh, miniaturization. The, the world is, is becoming uh, miniaturized uh, and as it becomes miniaturized, uh, each of us is in the world of the other, consciously or unconsciously, directly or indirectly, uh, but, but unavoidably. Uh, at conferences like this, among the people with whom most of us associate, uh, this is a phenomenon that has a name, we, 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 we can talk generally about it, uh, and we can have a glimmer of understanding about what's going on, but as a broad phenomenon in society, it, it, it's, it's a mystery. Uh, and uh, people feel it, they feel the effects of it, uh, they sometimes feel the positive effects of it when they get uh, at the local market uh, relatively inexpensive goods, uh, but they also feel the negative effects of it as they, as they see uh, the transformations that are caused in the operation of a, a global economic system. It is distinctly not simply a, a, an economic phenomena. It, it, is, it cuts across every sector of, of society and essentially uh, it's the disappearance of boundaries. Now, universities have always operated in a boundaryless phenomena. That's always been our world because ideas don't have boundaries. And, and if you, if the, the universities go back, you know, a millennium, and, and they always involved uh, the itinerant scholar who, who, who moved around uh, a, a, a system. But the reactions, uh, the reactions to this phenomena of miniaturization, borderlessness, globalization, whatever you want to call it, are quite bipolar and quite extreme. Uh, so one of the reactions to it that, that one sees at the broad level is, is the ascension of nativism, the, the ascension of, of, of what might be called localism, a desire to be with people that are like you and to put up gates. I mean, you hear this going on in the presidential conversation in the United States, literally talking about walls and gates. Uh, and, and, and all of the, whether it's the, the Scottish secession movement or, or, or uh, the Eastern Ukraine or, 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 you know, Venice deciding to take a vote to withdraw from Italy. I mean, it's happening all over the world that, that there's this kind of a nativism response. There is a, a second, as I say, polar opposite response where one finds higher education. And, and, and that, that is the world of, of uh, understanding and embrace of difference. And, and the delight that comes from encountering difference. And, and it's very important to understand higher education, education in general, thought in general, is on that side of the equation. But we're, we're at an inflection moment where uh, human, humankind could, could fragment into a clash of civilizations, uh, and we could begin to see people different from us as, as uh, as ter terrifying, or uh, forces like higher education can step to the fore and, and embrace at this large level the, uh, a world which is a community of communities. And I, I take very seriously uh, what uh, the Prime Minister told us this morning in his keynote address that as, as one, we, what we don't want is homogenization. We don't want to take the wonder of the difference among the creations we call human beings. We don't want to take that and homogenize it and make it all one. We certainly don't want to see a particular 
sector triumphant over others. But the notion is how do we create a community of communities where we maintain that individual identity, we have understanding, we, we, we build bridges and tunnels, and, uh, and, and we work through to something that uh, a good metaphor might be a watch where you can still see the individual parts, but the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So uh, it, it, the world of interconnectedness is there. Uh, there's a single network that's there. In the world in which we live, uh, the university community lives, uh, in that worldwide network, there, there will emerge, there are emerging, uh, some would say they already have emerged. If you read the work, for example, of uh, my colleague at NYU, Richard Florida, uh, idea capitals, you know, concentrations of thought and creativity. Seoul would be one, uh, London would be one, New York would be one, Los Angeles, I have to say, would be one, even though they stole my favorite baseball team generations ago. But there, there are these idea capitals that, that are connected uh, to each other in, in, a, in a network. They're magnets for talent and, uh, and high-end creativity. Uh, Singapore would be an example of that. That's the theory of Singapore in a way that we heard this morning. And at the heart of it, of course, is higher education. So let me turn from that now uh, for, for a bit about, uh, to talk about higher education uh, as an element, I would say a core element, a key element uh, in the evolution of, of this world that we see evolving before us. I, I think the one thing to remember this morning, and this also was, was touched upon by the Prime Minister, is, is that higher education is, is a symphony orchestra of offerings. Uh, the, the search for a single form of higher education would be a deeply erroneous and flawed search. Uh, the, 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 this notion of, of, of streamlining that the Prime Minister talked about, uh, we, we should understand humans come into the world with different talents. Humans come into the world with different levels of talent. And what we want to do is match individuals with education that will drive them to the highest articulation of their talent, that will, will cause them to, to fulfill themselves as best they can. And I use the symphony orchestra metaphor because, uh, first of all, some will, 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 will help produce the orchestration, but they may not be in the orchestra itself. Uh, th th there are some people for whom we should not uh, uh, propose higher education. Uh, for, for, for others, some should be in the violin section, some should be in the percussion section, some in, in, in the woodwinds and, and so forth and so on. The key thing is matching the individual with the place in the orchestra that he or she should be and, and not to have that matching imposed upon the individual by virtue of uh, where or to whom he or she was born. Uh, we, we, we have to begin to think as a higher education community about our obligation to find find young people, and increasingly as lifelong learning becomes a theme, uh, find, find people it, where they are in their lives and offer them the education, in this case tertiary education is what we're talking about, higher education, that is suited uh, best to them. And, and that, that means that each element in the symphony orchestra of higher education, each part of the orchestra, has to know, and this connects a bit to what uh, Jeffrey Pfeffer was talking about in his talk, you have to know your goals and you have to be able to, to, to articulate and impose upon those who are, have the responsibility for being in a classroom, being in a school, being in a university. You have to say, th this is your role in the orchestra. And if you're in the violin section, you shouldn't be playing uh, uh, brass or pounding on your, uh, to make percussion. So, so uh, but we have to be very careful as we develop these uh, purposes for uh, the elements in the orchestra of higher education. We have to be very careful about oversimplifying the metrics. And I, I will tell you that uh, as I move to the end, I've been 14 years at NYU, as I move to the end of my presidency, I, I see worrisome signs that uh, uh, because the simple metrics are the easiest to develop and apply, that the measurers will measure what's easy to measure. 
and they will fail to see uh, that which is uh, key to creating people who are joyful and fulfilled in, in, in their lives. So I think that we in the university community have to, uh, I, the, the, this is, I'm gonna use English letters here. Uh, the, the, we have to be careful not to educate people who are I-shaped. Just a single line, this, the letter I. So, so perhaps long, perhaps deep if you wanna say, but, but very narrow in focus. Uh, one, of the, one of the great things that we have to do to prepare our students and, uh, and to engage in research which is adapted to the world of change is to create T-shaped people. So people that are deep, not sacrificing depth, but have a breadth of context. And, and that, of course, is where uh, what our universities have done, and each of the three universities you'll hear from have done this differently, uh, NYU has been extremely aggressive about saying one of the things that we want to teach to our students, one of the things that we see as a core in our section of the orchestra, which let's face it, you're dealing with students that are among the most talented in the world. So you, if you do it in percentiles, we're dealing with the top 1%, the top 2% of students, which means we're dealing with the top 1% or 2% of, of, of faculty. And those people have to be educated to be leaders. And if they're gonna be leaders in this world of globalization, they've got to know how to operate across boundaries. So, so we've created what we call uh, a global network. Our university is, is, is not fixed in one place. But in one minute, the global network is not, is not a branch campus system. It's not that New York is headquarters and the rest of the world's NYU manifestations are branch campuses, no. There, there, there are now three doorways that a student in Seoul or in Buenos Aires or, or, or in San Francisco or in Accra, three doorways you can enter NYU through. Uh, and each of those doorways has a full research university presence. So New York, Shanghai, and Abu Dhabi. And then you enter and you'll find students who have entered literally from around the world and uh, you'll have them as roommates and classmates and so forth. And, and they are, in, in, in Abu Dhabi, for example, the largest population group is the American group at only 15%, 1-5%. And in a student body of only 1,000 students, there are 112 countries represented. The median student speaks four languages. So you're gonna be in a very cosmopolitan environment. And then no matter which campus you entered, no matter which of the three is your doorway, as an undergraduate, you'll do five of your eight semesters at that campus. And the other three semesters you'll do at either one of the other two doorways, or we have 12 study away sites on six continents around the world. And you circulate, and it is not a branch campus system. It is an organic circulatory system. So the faculty circulate, the students circulate, the staff circulate, and that means everybody has the interest in the quality of every place else. But this is one version this is one version designed to produce a particular type of, of, uh, of leader from one part of the orchestra. Uh, and it's important that if you're in the section of the orchestra where we are, all three of the universities represented here, that you be extremely aggressive about being out there to discover talent that might not get to you unless you're aggressive about looking for it. So just it, to give you a contrast, I'm the chairman of the board of a university called University of the People. University of the People. Uh, it is an accredited American university. If you are a high school graduate, fluent in English, have access to the internet, and you're poor, abjectly poor, you're admitted if you want to be admitted. And it's free. And you're put into classes, all virtual, with 30 other students, and you take a course the way you would if you were at Seoul National or at NYU or at UCL and you go through that class with a volunteer teacher, you take an exam at the end, you get credit for it, you aggregate your courses. Now what's the connection between that and NYU's global network? Because we're constantly watching the performance of students in university to people, and when a student excels there, we give them an opportunity to come to NYU on a scholarship. So you, we've gotta use things like the internet, like technology, like the MOOCs as search engines that give kids ladders up lest the kid, for example, that I taught yesterday, 
in, in NYU Shanghai campus who we found through the University of the People who's from Afghanistan, a woman from Afghanistan. She never would have gotten to us if we weren't out there searching. That's what we must do if we're going to fulfill our obligation as higher education in a globalized society. And that, to me, is what the internationalization of higher education is about. Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you, Dr. Sexton. Uh, he informed us with uh, NYU's phenomenon, uh, NYU's gl uh, globalization strategy that allows st uh, students and faculty to actively circulate across six continents. And what he mentioned about university, uh, always boundless phenomenon, or a symphony orchestra is very impressive. Uh, as he mentioned, I believe that uh, NIU's active method uh, toward globalization greatly uh, contributes to uh, stimulate diverse talents. Uh, I would like to express sincere respect for NIU on facilitating the infrastructure on which active global participation could take place. We will uh, talk more in the discussion session later. Thank you, Dr. Sexton, again. Our next speaker is Dr. Michael Arthur, the president and provost of University College London. Dr. Arthur is a medical doctor and a scientist. Uh, he was the Vice Chancellor of University of Leeds uh, from 2004 before he has taken the current leadership in uh, 2013. Uh, the, the title of his talk today is UCL 2034 From Internationalization to Global Engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Arthur. Uh, well, let me uh, add my uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, come and speak to you. Uh, it's always good fun uh, speaking at conferences. It's always extremely good fun uh, speaking after John Sexton, which is marginally better than speaking before him. So, uh, so John, uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Now I'm going to give you what I think will be a complementary but perhaps slightly uh, different view. Um, so the first point I want to make really is uh, the difference in my mind between internationalization and global engagement. Internationalization is something that I think most of you will be uh, fully aware of. Global engagement to me um, is internationalization incorporated into everything uh, that your uh, university does. And what I'd li like to do is to take you through a little bit of information about UCL a little bit about our strategy, because I think if you don't understand our strategy, you can't really understand what we're trying to achieve internationally, and then cone in a little bit on the international piece uh, as the talk continues. So um, a little bit about UCL. Uh, we're a very large, comprehensive, research-intensive uh, university. Uh, we perform fairly well in most of the world league tables. We would always be in and around uh, the top 20. We're quite a large organization by UK standards, some 37 and a half uh, thousand students now, uh, with over a thousand professors and 6,000 uh, academic uh, and research staff, about 12,000 uh, staff in all. Uh, we're quite international in our student body, 30% of our students coming from uh, international destinations, with another 12% uh, from the uh, EU. So that makes us only 58% uh, um, uh, home students. Um, and that is um, a number that's shrinking relative to the international students year by year because we're seeing a huge growth uh, in international student interest. Uh, the largest group, of course, are from uh, China, uh, about 3,300 students this year, 12,000 international students in all, and around about 200, uh, I believe, uh, from uh, Korea. Interestingly, we undertake, as a university, we undertake historically very, very little 
in the way of active marketing, although we do turn up at some uh, uh, recruitment fairs. Uh, we don't use agents at all, so almost all of our student body is attracted by a combination of the academic excellence of UCL and, of course, London uh, as uh, a global city um, and our proud uh, history. Um, that's uh, unusual, I think, and, and in particular unusual to have that number of students with just that limited level of marketing. Um, I need to tell you about this guy. This is Jeremy Bentham. Um, he uh, is often described as being a founder of UCL, which he wasn't, in fact. He was about 80 years old uh, when UCL started, but he was a very distinguished philosopher of his day, and he was hugely uh, influential. He enters my life on a daily basis because if you look at the centre panel there, that's what we call Jeremy Bentham's auto icon. It is actually his actual body uh, in a box. Not much of it left these days. I can reassure you when you're looking at the head that that bit is a wax uh, effigy. Uh, his real head is currently in the deep freeze in the anatomy department. Uh, I kid you not, he, this was Jeremy Bentham. He wanted to leave his body to the university that he was so uh, proud of founding. So he sits there literally outside my office and I see him every uh, day of the week. Every time we change president, he does turn up to the meeting to elect the new president where he's recorded as being um, uh, present but not voting. Uh, and you can see um, our students on the, as you look at it, the right hand uh, panel, uh, here, everyone's wearing a Jeremy Bentham uh, mask, which actually was a fundraising activity that was a lot of fun, and Jeremy therefore still influences philanthropy uh, at UCL. So we were founded in 1826, as you've already uh, been told, um, and at that stage we were only the third uh, university in England, not in the UK. There were some ancient universities in Scotland, uh, of course, uh, but at that stage, there was only Oxford and Cambridge, and in order to enter them, you had to be A, a man, and B, a practicing member of the Church of England. So UCL was set up to be the complete opposite. So it was open to all, irrespective of race, uh, religion, or social background, or class. Um, it very much had Jeremy Bentham's spirit uh, at the start of university. It has historically been a very uh, rebellious, a sli slightly anti-establishment uh, institution, and that culture still runs through the organization today. Shortly after arriving as president, I decided that I'd better work with that grain rather than work across it. Um, and it's crucially important to the way the place works. It's fiercely, fiercely uh, autonomous. Um, it is the first university in the UK to admit women uh, on the same basis as men, and that was, uh, I think, in the 1870s. Uh, uh, Jeremy uh, influences the value set. Uh, you can see them here. Commitment to excellence, advancement on merit, fairness uh, and equality, diversity, etc. I won't read the entire list. It's fairly uh, obvious uh, that that's a very deep uh, value set um, that pervades uh, the function of the organization. Uh, and so that's the background. That's the background to UCL. Uh, and it was that that we started to think about where we'd like to go as an organization as I started as president two, uh, just over two years ago. So the first thing um, I wanted to do was to present you not so much with the content of this slide except for one element, and that is that we uh, decided that we would think very long term. So most universities set a strategy that runs for three years, five years, or maybe 10 years, and I was very much of the view that partly because of where UCL had got to, partly because of its uh, established academic excellence, that we could afford to think much longer term. And I think that single thought has actually been uh, unbelievably important um, in what's happened uh, in terms of our thinking about uh, uh, our global engagement strategy and internationalization more generally. In fact, it's been important overall. Uh, we've made some huge decisions recently uh, that um, uh, I, I think could only be made, uh, made in the context of a 20-year time frame. So the first was to merge with another major institution, the Institute of Education, and the second major decision along those lines is to start a second uh, campus, uh, which will be in the east end of London in Stratford on the Olympic Park site. 
something that will be ready in about, uh, well, about the same time as I retire, I think. Um, this is uh, our long-standing uh, mission. Uh, we are London's global university, a diverse intellectual community engaged with the wider world and committed to changing it for the better. You recognize the uh, utilitarian uh, uh, emphasis from, from uh, Bentham even now. Recognized for our radical and critical thinking and its widespread influence with an outstanding ability to integrate our education, research, innovation and enterprise for the long-term benefit of humanity. We have uh, six themes and the point of showing you these six themes is to, is to show you just how frequently the word global appears across all six of those themes. So academic leadership grounded in, intell in intellectual excellence, fairly obvious. A global leader in the integration of research and education, I'll come back to that shortly. Uh, somebody criticized the use of the word inspirational uh, earlier today. I disagree with that. I think it's really important that we try to give our students an in inspirational uh, student experience uh, when they're with us. Uh, we think that we're addressing global challenges. We do that through a combination of disciplinary excellence, but also um, quite a distinctive emphasis on cross-disciplinary uh, approaches to our research and education. Uh, London's Global University, we're thinking a lot about our uh, position and our interaction with our, uh, with our great capital city. Um, and then uh, the slightly more conventional, uh, what are we doing out and ara around the world? Well, what we think we would like to do is to, to deliver uh, global impact through a network of innovative international activities, collaborations and partnerships. Um, w thinking of the themes of this slide, of course, to run a university, you need, you need good systems in place. You obviously need facilities for students. You need to finance everything appropriately. Uh, you certainly need IT systems that function better than the ones we've got at the moment. Uh, there are always, in central London, huge issues uh, surrounding the states. But above all, and particularly for this uh, conference, truly valuing uh, equality and diversity and doing a lot to change things. Now, I'd be the first to admit that UCL, like many other universities, has a very long way to go. But we absolutely have equality and diversity as a very key factor. In fact, all of my deans have specific targets that they're um, endeavoring to reach by year end in terms of improving our profile uh, in equality and diversity. And I make uh, no excuse for this. Um, we are doing that. Uh, simply because we think it will give us a huge competitive advantage. If the best people from other races and the best women um, in the UK and around the world spot what we're doing and come to us because of it, then I think uh, that's exactly what we're uh, trying to achieve and why we're giving it uh, such an emphasis. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, our students and how we um, prepare them for the fast globalizing world. And I think the bottom line is that there is no simple, uh, easy formula. One thing that everyone has talked about at this conference is just how fast the world is changing, um, about the level of uncertainty that there is uh, in the world that uh, each of our students will face, just how frequently, of course, they are uh, likely to change their careers uh, throughout their uh, working lifetime as well. So, so my view is that we've got to produce students who are critical um, uh, and independent thinkers who can understand that complexity uh, and shape themselves to cope with it. And the way in which uh, we do this, which has been very much a lifelong theme uh, for me, uh, is to bring uh, our students to the research process. Research and education belong together. In academia, they tend to be pulled apart by external assessment processes. Uh, it's our job as academics to bring them close together. And for me, that means taking all of the students through a research-based pedagogy involving the, research, uh, involving the students in research from day one so that they understand what knowledge is. They get taken to the edge of knowledge. They understand how it's created. They can join in with that process. It's hugely enjoyable. That's why most of us became academics in the first place. Why not let the students uh, have that fun? Let them learn through that process about uncertainty, 
let them become more confident uh, in dealing uh, with that uncertainty. And out of the far end, I think, uh, comes the creative, critical, independent thinker, the problem solver. People usually in research these days have to participate in teamwork, good communication, and they um, ultimately, through that process, I think, become highly employable leaders of the future and capable themselves of delivering uh, global impact. Now, I'm going to um, take you now into uh, international uh, issues in a bit more detail as it relates to this strategy. And the first thing I want to do is to acknowledge uh, this uh, individual. It turns out that she's a Leeds graduate, and that's how I uh, originally uh, met her. Uh, she uh, is a distinguished senior diplomat, or was a distinguished senior diplomat in the Foreign Commonwealth Office, and she was High Commissioner to South Africa. And I persuaded Nicola to enter a process to uh, become our Vice Provost International. And this was a very deliberate move uh, on my part. I really did feel that if we were going to run a different type of uh, internationalization process and strategy, that we really did need someone who was an international specialist first, who could learn about academia, as opposed to the more common model of someone who's an academic who takes up this role and then who learns about international issues. So Nicola joined us uh, around about uh, 18 months ago. And the second point I want to make is that it's crucially important that if you're going to do something different internationally, that you absolutely bring uh, the academic community with you. So uh, as opposed to this being top down, this is the complete opposite. We had a rough idea of what we wanted to achieve. And what we um, did was really a very, very exhaustive uh, university-wide uh, consultation process with uh, all of our staff, not just academic staff, professional services staff too, uh, and uh, the uh, entire uh, student body, or at least representatives from the student body. So um, that process of bottom-up and consultation, I think, was crucially important in where we landed. We did uh, ask all of those people to consider all of the elements of internationalization. So international staff, we run at around about 40%. Uh, over 100 countries. Uh, international students, I've already given you those figures. International mobility, uh, were enough of our students going out around the world and our staff. The international content of all of our curricula. Uh, I discovered the other day that we currently run 999 different programs, uh, a nightmare, uh, slightly different to the six that I heard about from Melbourne the other day. Um, uh, we run a global citizenship program. I'll come back to that shortly. We were looking at the international quality of our education, the platform of provision, whether or not we were interested in uh, overseas campuses. Uh, and the short answer from me is that that's not where we've gone. Um, and for reasons maybe we can bring out uh, in discussion later. Uh, we obviously wanted to look at the international quality and impact of our research and our innovation and enterprise. And our view was that a university like UCL should be able to point to bringing partners to the UK and uh, international partners overseas, not just in higher education establishments, but wider um, than that, and preferably, of course, uh, thinking there of uh, industry. Um, so, um, What, um, what uh, did we land up with? So this is um, where we uh, landed. Um, we developed this concept of moving away from straightforward internationalization to this broader concept of uh, global engagement. And to summarize it in just three sentences, uh, for, that, for us that meant focusing on the impact of what we were doing internationally, um, making a difference, being of benefit to humankind, and not being too hung up on the size of our footprint uh, overseas. Uh, we absolutely see in that context working in partnership and we want to work with partners to find uh, what we would call fair and wise solutions to global challenges. So another quick way of saying that is think global uh, but act together with your partners in solving those problems. And for our uh, students, uh, giving our students the best possible preparation for global careers and lives. This concept, again, of global challenges, 
tackling global challenges, co-creating, co-creating, so equal partnerships, not UCL dictating what should happen, but working with other organisations in a truly joint fashion uh, to address global challenges and problems. Uh, we're also interested in increasing independent research capability around the world. Um, much of that relates to our activities uh, in uh, Africa. Uh, we mustn't forget that enterprise innovation and translational research should also uh, be part of delivering those long-term solutions, and we hope that all of that will hope to uh, grow uh, our profile. A few quick words about the Global Citizenship Program. How do you make sure that the vast majority of your students get exposed to the concept of global citizenship? And ultimately, I think this should be integrated back into uh, every program that we run. But currently, uh, we run a separate program. It's open to all first and second year students, whether they're international home uh, or EU. Uh, it's a voluntary program at the moment, but this year we had over 1,000 students sign up for it. Uh, it's not credited. Uh, it runs in the summer term and it runs after examinations. And why did a thousand people uh, turn up for it? Because um, it's a huge opportunity to work with people from around the world in an interdisciplinary team working way, uh, problem solving surrounding those uh, grand challenges. And through that process, we believe that our students are learning a little bit about what it means to uh, be an effective uh, global citizen. So um, how do you uh, finish a talk like this? Um, and uh, I chose to use a picture. Uh, equality uh, and diversity uh, ably demonstrated in this uh, slide with the next generation, in this case, of uh, graduating uh, PhD students uh, from the summer. So I think every picture tells a story. And in this case, I hope you find it reasonably compelling. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Afe. Dr. Afe introduced UCL 2034 and its strategies and methods. The UCL strategy could be summarized as fostering critical, uh, independent thinking and creativity. Uh, it ultimately strengthens an individual's problem-solving skills within the global context. And another strategy is uh, taking students to the edge of knowledge and let them learn to deal with uncertainty is very suggestive because the future society uh, will have plenty of uncertainties. And the Global Citizenship Program deserves particular attention uh, since uh, it lo uh, looks to be a further developed form of student mobility and internationalization. The purpose of the Global Citizenship Program uh, reminds me the idea of uh, Republic of Korea, Hong Ik Ingan meaning benefit all the mankind far and wide. And uh, Yongsan University, to which I serve, has the same founding idea. The spirit of global citizenship program is highly respected, and wider research activities and participation is desirable. I suggest UCL to share valuable experiences on this. And mm -hmm. um, our last speaker is Dr. Levine, uh, Stephen Levine, the president of California Institute of the Arts. Uh, with a literature background, Dr. Levine has served as the president of the world leading art school. Car Arts. Uh, for uh, 27 years. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Levine. I'm really uh, honored and flattered to be on a panel with presidents of two great large universities. Um, perhaps I've invited because we're a great small college, 
only 1,500 students to NYU's 55,000 students, and uh, university colleges, 37,000. But with a new campus coming, I expect you're growing further. Um, eventually, I'm going to talk about how, as a small college and an arts college, we're approaching internationalization. But I want to start stepping back a little bit and talk about educational change generally. Educational systems are notoriously difficult to change even when it's obvious that they're failing. Not only do they, like all bureaucracies, uh, tend to resist change uh, through the inertia of the existing faculty, or let's say the existing staff and leadership, um, but their fundamental nature is culturally overdetermined. Uh, in most nations, these systems were originally designed to reinforce shared regional and national values and to prepare future workers to accept the conditions under which they would find themselves working. Um, one can see the, the continuation of that sort of issue in the current debate in Korea about government-sponsored uh, history texts. Uh, that, that, that comes out of a long history of universities being also kind of ideological national organizations. Even where educational goals are not overtly articulated, educational systems tend to reflect the culture's values and practices because from within the culture, these practices seem obviously correct. Moreover, the greater su the success of the, of the system in the past, the more difficult it is for it to change in the face of a future. I think we heard a little bit of that uh, from the former Prime Minister of Singapore this morning. Uh, it's exactly the, the huge success of Singapore that makes the next steps of change a challenge. I expect the same thing might be said about the Korean educational system. Yet today, educational systems worldwide are struggling to break out of uh, persistent culturally embedded practices so as to address the, t the twin challenges of an ever-increasing internationalization of economic life and a growing emphasis on individual and small group entrepreneurship to create new areas of economic activity. In these circumstances, I believe, international exchange and cooperation have a huge amount to offer, as does the creative problem solving uh, taught in certain forms of arts education. In the past, uh, the, the core approach to internationalization was uh, to study abroad uh, for a year or a whole graduate program. Uh, this had the advantage in that the educational system of the of the student's home country didn't have to change, uh, nor did the educational system of the country in which the student was studying. Uh, certainly over the years, uh, studying internationally, uh, which has mainly been the province of privileged students, um, has prepared the kind of binational uh, citizens the, the current world uh, desperately needs. In recent years, uh, business schools especially, uh, recognizing the different financial and legal practices of different countries, uh, have tended to develop semesters at, in other countries and use that as very close to the core of the education they offer. In fact, it's hard now to find a business school that does not have some international dimension built in. More recently still, uh, We've seen in highly centrally controlled economies in such countries as China, Singapore, and the Arab Emirates, um, the aggressive uh, internationalization of economic life by subsidizing universities from other countries to set up shop in their territories. Most often this has been framed as a way to gain expertise in a particular area of study and most often safeguards are put in place to avoid the imposition of foreign cultural practices and expectations. Uh, one of the things that is particularly strong in NYU's international efforts is 
they have managed to build uh, situations in which they students are not insulated from uh, the culture of the country in which they're living, but in fact uh, there is openness, um, even with with the uh, with the Chinese campus. Uh, the California Institute of the Arts, where I have served as president for a very long time, is a recognized leader in the progressive education of actors, animators, dancers, filmmakers, graphic designers, musicians, composers, basically all the arts. For the past 20 years, we've been experimenting with the right way to prepare our students for working in the internationalized environment. Because in fact, most of our students' careers as artists will now be at least partially, if not wholly, uh, international. Here the particular challenge and the particular opportunity is that what we are teaching is not particularly technique of the arts, but rather a, a culture of creative problem solving, which is generally American, specifically Californian, and to some extent uniquely CalArtian. Those embedded cultural practices which many international educational efforts attempt to hold at bay are the very center of what we have to offer and equally of what we have to learn when we collaborate. Uh, today, in a very, again, a small college, 1,500 students, uh, students from uh, 50 different countries work side by side. Uh, we're about 50% women, about 50% men. We are, in terms of American diversity, uh, probably the most diverse, highly selective institution in the United States. Uh, like John was saying, you have to go out and seek the talent. There's no shortage of talent. You just have to remove the obstacles uh, uh, to the talent arriving. At the same time as, uh, so, excuse me. Uh, each year our number of international students is increasing. Our challenge is to reach a balance such that the particularly American or CalArtian pedagogy and culture of creative problem solving, which is what attracts students in the first place, is kept strong even as we bring together students from other cultural traditions uh, where, that, where our approach is, is quite foreign and a big challenge. Um, at the same time as we're internationalizing our campus as a whole, we're experimenting with a variety of different ways to give our students formative experience in other cultures and also to share our approach to education of artists and other creative workers with groups of students coming for shorter periods from other countries. We're great believers in learning by doing uh, that means in our context, courses about other cultures or about globalization, while valuable, do not really get to the point of being able to actually work and create uh, in an international context. So what we look for is collaborations where our students have an opportunity to have that experience. Uh, we like that both for the immediate impact on the students and also because done properly, it changes our own institution. Thus, to give just one example, a collaboration with the University of Guadalajara built around the three-year development of the professional production of a play by a young Mexican playwright has left us with continuing collaborations with a host of Mexican playwrights and directors, and also our own bilingual theater company, which is entirely appropriate living in a city uh, where more than 50% of the, Los Angeles, where more than 50% of the people are of Hispanic heritage. Last year, a three-week intensive for production managers uh, from the Shanghai Theater Academy, introducing them to Western styles of production management, which are reflections of Western styles of creative problem solving, um, with their demand for independent decision making has not only helped several of their students to gain employment, uh, in this case at the new Disney Shanghai, uh, but has also opened up new opportunities uh, in China 
for production managers graduating from CalArts. Uh, this relates to the issues that our human resource professionals this morning were talking about, uh, the different styles of work in different environments and how we prepare people to adapt to it. We also have done a very interesting experiment with the, so the Seoul Institute of the Arts using telepresence uh, with half the students in Los Angeles and half the students in Seoul uh, taking courses together. We had some problems with logistics in that, but I think there's huge possibilities for the future uh, that this networked world is, is, going to op uh, is going to offer us. To cite just one further example in the mode of short-term collaboration, uh, Chung'an University's theater department brought a stripped-down production of Shakespeare's King Lear to CalArts in 2010. This production, in turn, became the basis for a new production with Korean students and their CalArts counterparts collaborating. Students from CalArts in all disciplines interacted with the piece to create an entirely new project called Lear Layer, uh, performed in Korean, English, and Spanish. Uh, the exposure to different processes and real-time creative problem solving far exceeded the educational possibilities that could emerge in the classroom alone. Indeed, this one project spanning just a few weeks functioned as a highly rigorous course into itself uh, with powerful cultural and aesthetic exchange. Moreover, the students worked effectively together with minimal translation their common language being the energy of youth uh, and the processes of making. Beyond these programs, we've developed special intensives uh, in the CalArts approach to creative problem solving for groups of students coming to us from Hongik University uh, and also Kukmin University. These have taken the form of one month, one week, and three month intensives. Uh, the one-week session proved too brief to be anything but a kind of tourist visit. The one-month and three-month versions offer a deep plunge uh, into the challenge of independent problem solving that is the core of our educational approach. Um, I could go on in some detail about those workshops. I'll just say at the most fundamental level, these intensives could be in almost any area of the arts with the common element being that students are required to define their own direction, that is to set their own problem, uh, to encounter through an iterative process the challenge of moving forward in the direction of their own solution. For the students to experience failure in a context where there's no punishment for failure, uh, where instead there's the reward for moving on from failure uh, to the next step in your own process of creation. Uh, the response of these guest students is a compressed version of the experience of many of our regularly enrolled international students, and sometimes of our American students as well. First shock, confusion about what to do, followed by a testing of their own ideas with guidance in pursuing the logic of those ideas until the project is completed. Often these students have never before been asked to move beyond following directions given by their teachers. Um, we find the results are astonishing. Uh, students discover a kind of strength that they didn't know they had, uh, asked to create from scratch uh, in a compressed time uh, period, a work of their own. These intensive requ require a special kind of teacher who's willing to help, but who does not assume there is a right answer, and who is ready patiently to work as a colleague as much as as a teacher. Students are emboldened to take creative risks and to understand that with creative risk comes failure, which again is not judged negatively, but rather is understood as part of the creative process. Um, this is, I guess I have a few minutes yet. Um, 
These short courses offer an intensive version of what we teach all our students, an additional component which works better in uh, the three-month version is exposure to the multidisciplinary nature of CalArts. The fundamental premise of CalArts was that in the modern world, all the arts are borrowing from one another, that most creation will involve multiple areas of the arts, and that teaching students in a narrow silos, and I think that metaphor has been brought up before, the T, uh, the and narrow silos is not the way uh, to give them uh, the possibilities of interesting creative lives. In our era of internationalized economic activity, internationalized problems, and individual and small group entrepreneurship, the kind of collaborative projects I've described above, as well as our pedagogy of creative, which puts at the very heart, uh, this issue of creative problem solving. And understand there are two ways you could teach the arts. Uh, ballet traditionally has been uh, taught entirely at the other extreme, that you learn to do it exactly as your teacher learned to do it from her teacher, from her teacher, and you're proud that you can, tr you can trace your lineage uh, back to the middle of the 19th century. Um, that can produce great wonders uh, it is not a system that prepares people for the rapidly changing nature of creative activity in our, in our contemporary world. I know from following the subsequent, we've, we've always had many uh, students from Korea at CalArts. Uh, probably the reason we have so many co collaborations with uh, Korean institutions um, is that our first vice president for uh, international activity was Korean. Um, and also, it's been a, a, a natural and easy connection to make. I know from following the subsequent careers of our international graduates, particularly those from Korea, that this education produces creative leaders. Uh, CalArts uh, alumni, Korean CalArts alumni, are found leading departments in universities uh, all over Korea at this point in the arts. Uh, as well as prominent in the television and film industries and in the design field. Um, some might worry that such creative leaders will become destructively disruptive. Um, I have to say the evidence is that that's not the case, uh, that the strong uh, sort of cultural disciplines taught growing up in Korea, uh, the learning to function in a largely hierarchical societal order while growing up uh, persists, but it's, it can be combined with uh, this greater access to a person's individual creativity and creative problem solving. It strikes me that much of the challenge of education everywhere in the world now is to make that happen. Uh, but I think it might particularly apply uh, from what people have told me about the Korean educational system. Finally, I'd just say that it's my conviction that a focus on creative problem solving in the arts would have much to offer students from almost any discipline, including entirely non-arts disciplines. In fact, it's my hope that one of the universities with whom we are collaborating will in time uh, want to test that premise by sending us business students or sending us uh, science students uh, to participate in intensives that are focused on, um, again, individual self-direction and creative problem solving. I think with such collaboration between different educational systems, and I offer the one I have experience with, but obviously all over the world, the versions of this are possible. I think we have uh, the possibility of opening up whole new doors uh, to a better future for all of us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Levine, for the insightful talk. Dr. Levine highlighted the necessity of highly competent workers to bridge the gap among cultures within the globalized economy. 
he also outlined the necessity of business activity to create new uh, areas of economic development. The educational practice in car arts helps us see how it could tackle problems to satisfy the social demands. Uh, and uh, also, I, I, I am uh, impressed by his meant learning by doing. Uh, learning by doing is different uh, from uh, learning by reading or hearing. Uh, it uh, it could, be, uh, could be a more important attitude of learning uh, for the future society. Uh, knowing, knowing intellectually differs from can doing. Uh, uh, very interesting and impressive. And uh, thank you uh, for all your talks, speakers. Let us begin our uh, discussion. To open our uh, discussion today, I have chosen a few topics we could further consider. First of all, I would like to ask every speaker today a question. Ma uh, many will agree that our new era has revolutionized pedagogical reconstruction of higher education. The technology and culture change the way of dissemination and consumption of knowledge. Consider MOOC, Massive Open Online Courses. Why should the student geographically move to another area in order to take top class lectures rather than watching a MOOC contents at home? How does this MOOC infrastructure affect our attitude toward looking at student mobility and internationalization. Who would like to answer first? Yeah, Dr. Arthur, please. Um, well, thank you very much. It's a question that's uh, often asked, and um, uh, I think the answer from my perspective is very simple. Um, if you are pursuing a research-based pedagogy for your students and you are serious about that, um, it's awfully complicated to do that uh, with an online methodology. So I think, I think you can use online, you can use that to blend uh, the learning experience. Uh, but if you, if you think that the research is important, then you largely, not, not exclusively, but largely need the students to be uh, on campus. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so I can foresee situations where you use online, uh, but it would need to be sandwiched between uh, elements of research activity which uh, have to be campus-based. And the other thing I would say is that um, MOOCs are still, I think, relatively in their uh, infancy. Um, and I think that, as far as I'm aware, nobody's following all the way through to degree level. So people are getting certificates, they're getting tasters, it's attracting students into your institution, um, and it works well in that regard. But following it all the way through to a full degree at either um, bachelor's or uh, master's level is as yet an unproven case. And certainly if you look at the cost of doing that, uh, m much of the cost of uh, providing um, degree level activity relates to the um, assessment and examination, and so it isn't necessarily that much cheaper. And there's a huge experience of that in the UK through the Open University, um, and you just need to look at their fee structure to see uh, my point being made. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Levine? Mm. We've been experimenting actively with uh, the potential of MOOCs. We don't offer credit for them at our own school. Um, but we've generated more arts-related ones, which is an area that most people thought it would be impossible to do it uh, than any other college in the United States, at least. Um, what we find is that the main benefit, as they currently exist, is that regional subgroups of students form. So within a, a, 
we taught a co computer programming course for artists with 54,000 people enrolled in the course. Um, but the students who accomplished a lot were ones who formed separate sort of sub-language groups. So uh, there was a Russian group uh, that was, tr they were actually becoming colleagues, uh, having the educational experience together. And uh, there seems to be a, a general evidence with MOOCs that, that that is where the greatest benefit has been to date. Um, we think that the end product for us will be some mix of online and in-person. Uh, we're experimenting with that right now. We're, we're training, there's no great school of animation in Latin America, uh, and yet there's a lot of Latin American animation. Uh, so we're working with the largest studio in Mexico to train their professionals to be animators. Uh, we do it partially in person, partially through pre-programmed MOOCs, and partially through live interactivity in real time. I think it'll be mixed modes. And the final thing I would say is that uh, art activity in the world, and this is, maybe this is just equally true of science, it, it kind of t turns on smelling the other person. You have to feel who you can trust, who you wanna, who you wanna be with, uh, and, it's, and for all that telepresence and online can give you some entry into that, it doesn't tell you in the end who's really gonna be a colleague who you wanna carry with you through the rest of your career. And we think that international education, one of the most important benefits, will be creating international networks of colleagues who support themselves in their subsequent careers. Dr. Mm. Sesten. Uh, so it, it, I, I'm struck by the convergence uh, among the three talks uh, at, at a deep level, and uh, it doesn't surprise me there's a convergence in answer to this question. So I think, first of all, all of us would agree that there's tremendous power in technology uh, providing a broad dissemination, a greater democratization of education right through to the tertiary level. Uh, so for the student in Afghanistan or Haiti or sub-Saharan Africa <clears throat> for whom the alternative is zero education, th then clearly a technology delivered education like the University of the People to which I referred uh, is key. Uh, and there's, there's going to be a spectrum. Uh, I urged earlier that we use technology as a search engine and then uh, as Steve points out, there's a kind of a, a, a brick and click kind of uh, combination that's, that's, that's possible. But notice the convergence in the three talks. Uh, it, each of them converged on what Steve has so artistically referred to as the sweat and the smell. <laughs> and, and there's something really to that. Uh, I, the, 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 the human contact of, you know, that's necessary in, in the creative process, be it research or in the arts, or, I mean, look, look, look uh, New York City, 40% of the citizens of New York City were born in other countries. New York City literally has a neighborhood for every country in the world that is inhabited by people who were born in that country. So you can visit Korea in New York and you can taste Korean food and hear the language and the prayers and taste uh, the, 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 the music. As broadening as that is at the human level, it's not the same as coming here. So, so that's, that's, the, the, that's the sweat and, 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 and the smell behind NYU's notion of, yeah, we'll use the city to get our students out into the world in that miniaturized context, but then we want to get them to the place itself. And, and I think all of us come down, that where, it, it depends on where you are in the orchestra. And if you want the fullest experience, the broadest experience, the one that, and it's, it, it can't be for everybody because society won't be able to afford to provide it for everybody. The key is making sure everybody that can benefit from it gets it. 
and, and that's the ladder up and the importance of providing opportunity and search engines. But each of us has converged around the fact that this, the, the human contact is critically important for this world that's emerging. And then I'll add just one other element which has been implied in uh, what we've said so far, which is serendipity. Whether it's in research or, or in the arts, serendipity, the conversation that isn't scheduled for X to Y online at a certain time, but happens in a dorm room in the, in, in the creativity of exhaustion or, or, or whatever. The, the, so if you want to be at the apex of the experience of higher education, it's not going to be delivered through a MOOC. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Th uh, thank you again, speakers. Anyway, uh, we must uh, pay attention to the MOOC infrastructure and new technology uh, for, uh, for the future uh, society of uh, academics. And uh, now I would like to dedicate the rest of the time for the floor. And uh, I have a few questions uh, from the floor. Uh, the first question is uh, for Dr. Robine. Uh, Korea is suffering from high uh, unemployment rate of university graduates. So Korean government emphasize for university uh, to make more uh, contribution to job creation uh, of students. Uh, what, uh, what, would, uh, what would say about job creation, uh, employment, education at university? Uh, for Dr. Levine. Yeah. Well, for, uh, first I would say <coughs> one, one can see in Korea <coughs> already an evolution in practice. We've been educating uh, graphic designers for, in Korea for many years. It used to be the only employment at the end of that was to be in one of the mega companies and to be in the, you know, if you could be in the design shop at Samsung, that was paradise. Over the last 10 years, a network of small design firms doing far more creative work are turning up all over Seoul. Um, where people feel they have more room to invent. Um, and I think we're gonna see that that kind of individual entrepreneurship produces ideas that the larger companies will then purchase and they'll disseminate it and carry it internationally. Um, the example I would offer of that from the United States is all these big feature films that travel the world, when you look at them, it looks like it came from Universal or from Fox. But in fact, almost all of them started with one or two independent producers and an independent director who had the idea, who built it to the point that then a major company invests the rest of the money and carries it forward. But the energy of creation starts in small group activity and we, we need, uh, and in individual activity. Uh, maybe that's not true in the mega sciences, I don't know. Um, but in, and certainly it is in the arts. And then just finally I'd say, uh, for Korea, which has had, I mean, the, the way Korean popular culture has taken over Asia is one of the great accomplishments in the arts uh, in the world in our time. Uh, when one thinks of the prevalence of Japanese culture, not just 20 years ago, uh, that was a deliberate result of educational strategy within Korea, and it suggests the kinds of results that can come uh, when the training adapts to create what's needed in the, in the forward-looking situation. I don't know if that answered your question or not, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And uh, next question is to uh, Dr. Arthur. Uh, thank you for your insightful uh, in internationalization strategy of UCL. I can see how world-renowned universities uh, think for uh, uh, internationalization. Uh, however, I wonder how Korea and other developing nations' universities should internationalize their education. Uh, I would be thankful if you can share with us how you think the universities in education 
Peri Peris can uh, achieve their own strategy internationalization? Uh, thank you. So that assumes I know a lot about Korean higher education. So the first thing I'll confess is that I'm a relative newcomer to, uh, to uh, the university scene here in Korea. Having said that, um, I had the pleasure yesterday of visiting uh, Yonsei uh, University where I saw huge efforts um, at uh, internationalization. Uh, the specific example was the creation of a, an international college, uh, which as far as I uh, understand has something like 400 uh, international, uh, no, sorry, 100 international students and 400 Korean students. Um, and is really a um, uh, rather like a four-year American liberal arts uh, program where those students are literally uh, learning uh, about different cultures. So I think it's the same for Korean higher education as it is for every uh, other part of the world. It's about bringing your students to international issues, uh, getting your students to mix with people from different cultures, getting your students to go out to the rest of the world and promoting exchange and activity uh, in a partnership context across universities from different parts of the world. I didn't really explain the sort of partnership thinking uh, mainly because of time constraints, but um, if you look at the ways in which universities work together, you can, um, I think, see three or four patterns emerging. So. There's a so-called sea of activity. So as academics, we all tend to have international collaborators. And sometimes that grows into a relationship between several academics in a faculty and another faculty in another university. And sometimes it's more than one faculty, at which point it becomes an institutional partnership. Um, so I, I think it would be wise um, of Korean universities, and I know they already do this, to, to really work that international partnership scene in the same way that we at UCL are, are, are trying to do. And um, I think you find your own level of partnership. Um, sometimes it's chemistry, serendipity, as John said, that you click with people. He and I have a good hug every so often. Uh, and uh, you know, just finding, just finding people that you can work with and building those partnerships, relationships, and creating all those things for your own students and for the students of your partner institution. Thank you, Dr. Arthur. And uh, this question is for Dr. Sexton. Yeah. Uh, there have been several American universities launched, uh, overseas, launched overseas, failed in operating and closed the campuses. Uh, what do you think? the major obstacles to operate the international campuses successfully? Uh, uh, no, this is second, uh, second uh, question. And first question is, what would have been the reasons they failed settling down in the countries? F uh, first, why they failed? Second, uh, uh, the uh, major obstacles is what? Yeah, maybe the what? Uh, yeah, yeah, why? why uh, the reason why they failed yeah. in settling down in overseas ca campus. Mm. So, so uh, the, as you've seen, uh, the, 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 there's a whole spectrum of activities, and I think that uh, 20 years from now, when we look back at this, uh, the, the, there'll be an even broader spectrum of activities ranging from the kind of partnerships that have existed for decades, uh, generations in some cases, uh, over to the, what is admittedly the most aggressive model, which is the N N NYU model, which is a, 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 a network, a, an organic circulatory system where the expectation is that people in the university will view it as a single university. Now, along the way, you could make analogies to airlines. Along the way, there, there, there's a, uh, a, a, you move from simple MOUs, you know, we'll put our passengers on your planes to literal code shares, and you move up an attempt to have a greater control on quality and greater integration. Now, I will tell you that uh, any uh, university 
that moves into a partnership as many early, uh, I'm sorry, moves into an overseas campus as many early movers did as a profit center is, in my view, dooming it from the beginning because uh, higher, quality higher education is not a profit center. Uh, none of the universities represented here uh, op operates at a, at a profit, no matter how high the tuition, we deliver more in terms of the cost of what it is. So high quality is, 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 uh, is only compromised if you are seeking to create a, pro a profit out of it. And some of the early movers did that. Others chose bad partners. And, and the, the partnership is key. Uh, so, so you have to make sure that uh, all of the core elements that are important to you, for us it was things like complete control over the academics, uh, to, uh, academic freedom, uh, uh, full, full control over things like admissions, staff, and, and, and so on, uh, independent uh, internet access, uh, no matter where we were. All of these things were absolute uh, be bedrock and we wouldn't have gone in if uh, they hadn't been agreed to, to in, in, in advance. Uh, the final thing I'll say is that we made the decision that creating an outpost created something that was too disconnected to be owned by the university as a whole. That, that, so when I make this reference to the organic circulatory system, if, 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 if you're in Abu Dhabi teaching biology 101 to students that are gonna be in my biology 201 class somewhere, uh, and you're gonna be in the office next to me uh, three years from now or four years from now, I care who you are, what you're doing, and what students are being admitted. Uh, you're, not, you're not some foreign legion that's, that's, that, that's off. Uh, to whom we relegate the people that are moving toward the end of their careers or, or for whom we hire people that we wouldn't hire in New York or we admit students we wouldn't. And the result is that each of our enterprises has elevated the standards. So, you know, with only 300 graduates out of NYU Abu Dhabi, we've only had two graduating classes, 150 each. Uh, we, we have five Rhodes Scholars. So, so uh, and we have them in every major graduate and professional school in, in, in the world. So they've elevated the quality of NYU and the same thing is happening at the Shanghai campus. So if you don't see it as advancing, as fully integrated, as organic, I think you run a risk that quality will deteriorate. If you don't choose the right partner, if you don't make things clear up, up front, all of these things are the danger points. Thanks. And uh, this question is again to Dr. Atel. Uh, many universities set a vision to try to make it a real success. But to proceed it uh, successfully, we have to overcome a lot of risks, obstacles, like a government policy, budget limitation, different sort of persons, uh, internal conflicts. My question is that what is the most important factor to make your vision really successful? What a great uh, question. So I have a favorite phrase, um, which one or two people in the audience will recognize. If it's easy, anyone could do it. So the fact that it's hard, difficult, and you have to come, overcome obstacles is what makes me get out of bed in the morning and want to be the leader of an academic uh, institution. So I think, um, the one thing, the one characteristic that I think you must have is persistence uh, alongside that clarity of vision. And I think if you've got that combination, then you can overcome almost any obstacle uh, thrown in your way. Yeah. And uh, last question. Uh, this, this question is to uh, Dr. Levine. The uh, most Indonesia, Sujanto, Sujanto, uh, uh, Mr. Sujanto, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, will you tell him uh, directly? Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I can uh, read this question. Will you please? 
my question about the student mobility uh, in the words. How about the standard for competences and employability? Because many countries have different uh, job, and how about standard? Same with the system. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Levine? Yeah. I didn't understand the question, I'm sorry. Uh, will you please uh, yes. question again? For student mobility, like uh, master, uh, bachelor, master, and uh, PhD, we have many uh, uh, lectures and many uh, subject matter. How about the standard and met with uh, employability in its global? Area, like uh, manager of production, innovation production, because every every country like uh, uh, industrial, agriculture, and service must same but with unique production each uh, country. Thank you. Well, again, what again? I'm still not quite sure I understand, but what I would say is the capacity for uh, independent creative problem solving is a necessary part of every expertise. Um, that how, how, whatever the standard that is set in different educational system or different cultural environment, um, this, this at least for the foreseeable future will remain something that um, sort of especially economic uh, enterprise demands, and so it becomes a valuable part of the education. Um, then there's the rest of the education, uh, which is basically technique at some level, um, and there the, you meet the local, the local need or the local standard. I hope that comes close to addressing what you're asking. Yeah. We'll speak afterward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we examined topics about student mobility and internationalization. There is a big change in the method of dissemination and knowledge consumption that demand, uh, uh, that demand repositioning of higher education. Facilitating an educational environment will foster students' ability to lead the changing world and to create new entrepreneurial values. I would like to thank all three speakers today for valuable knowledge and insightful views. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, now let me close this session. Thank you all.